What does red light therapy actually do to our cells to help improve our health? That's what we're gonna talk about in this video. So if you've been watching any of my videos, you should know already by now that I'm a huge fan of hyperbaric oxygen, but I don't believe that hyperbaric oxygen lives in a vacuum by itself. I love to combine different therapies to have synergistic effects. One of my favorite happens to be red light therapy. So red light therapy has a very specific effect on cellular function, particularly in the process of ATP production. ATP production happens in the electron transport chain inside your mitochondria. So before we get into the details of red light, let's just do a quick review of the electron transport chain so you understand what the steps are. That way we can circle back and talk about the effect that red light will have on that system. The electron transport chain is literally that last few steps of energy production in our cells and picture it as a factory. As a factory, you need to deliver raw materials and then you need to process those raw materials in order to make a product. And in this case, the product is ATP, which is the currency of cellular energy. It's what cells need to do all the different jobs that cells are required to do. And so we have in the electron transport chain, we have to get electrons from one end of the factory as a raw material through each step of the way until we get to the last step, which is ultimately energy production. There are a few spots in the electron transport chain that are considered to be stationary. And then you have a few spots in the electron transport chain which are considered mobile. And the mobile carriers are responsible for picking up electrons from one complex and delivering it to the next. And it just repeats that cycle. So you're trying to get electrons down this chain and a few of these are stationary. You can't get electrons from one complex to the next magically. You need a delivery system to do that. So mobile carriers are just that. They go back to one complex and deliver and all they do is repeat that. And as long as we can move electrons down that chain, we can get the electrons to the last step and ultimately create energy as a result. They have long names. We're not gonna get into their long scientific names in this moment. So we'll just call them complex one, complex two, complex three, complex four. And ultimately two mobile carriers. One is called ubiquinol and the other one is called cytochrome C. This whole process is all about moving electrons. If we can't move the electrons from complex one all the way through complex four, then we can't produce ATP. And these stationary complexes, all they are are holding spots of electrons. Ultimately, the real magic is in the mobile carriers. So that first mobile carrier was CoQ10. We've done a video on that, please check that out. The next mobile carrier is this thing called cytochrome C. Cytochrome C is a rate limiting step for ATP production. If cytochrome C can't ping pong from complex three to complex four, ATP production will cease to exist. And so creating stimulation of cytochrome C is absolutely mandatory for ATP production. The most potent and most important stimulant to cytochrome C 100% of the time is red light therapy. Red light, near infrared. These frequencies of red light help stimulate cytochrome C, literally improving the speed and the capacity for cytochrome C to move electrons from complex three to complex four. And so if we wanna produce energy, which all of us do, we need stimulation of cytochrome C. We need high energy density come into the system, right? The NAD and FADH2. We need CoQ10 to move it. And now we need cytochrome C again to move those electrons critical in this entire process. Where does red light therapy fit in terms of your daily life? Well, here's the thing. In terms of stimulation of cytochrome C, anywhere is perfectly appropriate. So whether you're getting it once or twice or four times a week, any of that is totally appropriate, depending on the intensity of the red light. Some sessions could be 10 to 12 minutes. Some sessions could be 30 minutes. So if you're getting somewhere between 10 to 30 minutes, you know, two to four times a week, that's typically pretty sufficient in terms of red light dosage that you might need for a typical requirement. Now, if you have certain health challenges, certainly you might want to use it more often or more frequently in order to get the benefits that you're looking for, but that's just a general protocol that you could follow. However, in terms of other effects that red light might have, placing it specifically around hyperbaric could be important. And so another effect that red light has is increasing nitric oxide inside your body. And nitric oxide will help vasodilate your blood vessels. And so as you vasodilate your blood vessels, you're making those hoses bigger, which means you can carry more blood more easily through your system. So as long as you're using hyperbaric below 2 ATA, using red light before your sessions, is a great moment to do that. Why? You go into the red light, 
you drop the nitric oxide, you vasodilate, and then you go into the hyperbaric, flooding the system with oxygen. Why am I saying below two atmospheres? Because at two atmospheres is really where the concern for central nervous system oxygen toxicity comes in. As you get to two atmospheres and above, the body, specifically the brain, goes through a lot of vasoconstriction. And that vasoconstriction is really to protect your brain from getting too much oxygen. So you don't want to vasodilate and then get enormous amounts of oxygen. That could set the stage for something like central nervous system oxygen toxicity. So just be aware of these things and make sure that you know what you're doing when it comes to which timing you're going to want. Or if you're a clinician, understand where central nervous system oxygen toxicity is and make sure that you're keeping your patients safe. Or if you're a patient going to a clinic, have this conversation with your doctors so that everybody's on the same page with regard to other treatments that you're doing and make sure that we're combining these things safely. So assuming that we're going 1.3, 1.5, 1.75, and you're getting some vasodilation before your treatment, everything should be great. And that's a really, really powerful way to make sure that you're getting the benefits of both. If you're using a hyperbaric at much higher levels, like two atmospheres and above, then doing either red light separately, like hours before or days in between, or even after sessions would be a safe way to do that. If you're doing hyperbaric at those lower pressures, then doing red light before that session would be totally appropriate. Okay. I hope that helps. I hope that helps you understand the connection, number one, between where red light hits your cell for as far as ATP production, but also where does red light and hyperbaric work together really well and how do we create those protocols to be meaningful. All right. So I hope you enjoy that. I hope you like it. Not only do I expect you to go back and review those first few videos on the electron transport chain so you understand the full scope of this conversation, but also make sure you stay tuned, subscribe so that you get notified because we have a few more coming up on this same topic understanding all the different steps of the electron transport chain and making sure you know how to improve mitochondrial function every step of the way. See you next time.